In this video, I want to talk about another form of enzyme regulation called covalent modification, specifically a subclass of covalent modification called reversible covalent modification. There's another video on irreversible modification in actually the next video. So if you recall, allosteric regulation was sort of this idea that uh, enzymes could be regulated by the concentration of effectors near an enzyme, right? So basically the idea there is that allosteric regulation is very it's pretty instant, right? It's instant and rapid based on what's going on in that enzyme's environment. If there are if there are inhibitors there, then they will inhibit it. If there are activators there, they will activate it. It's as simple as that. Um, and that happens right away, right? If those if those effectors are around that enzyme, covalent modification is a little bit different. It's first of all, it's a very very common form of regulation, um, but the effects are usually um, slower and uh, last longer. Okay, they're slower and last longer than allosteric regulation. And covalent modification is actually really, really important when we think about signal transduction, which we'll talk about in a later video. So um, there are two types of covalent modification. There's phosphorylation and de dephosphorylation. At least these are the, these are the two that we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about the definitions of these two things. So the function, as far as what is what is phosphorylation? Phosphorylation is simply adding a phosphate group, which I will represent with a P and a circle. Okay, so a phosphate group. Dephosphorylation is removing a phosphate group. Okay, so now where are these phosphate groups added? And or where are they removed from? Okay, so the target is really just any hydroxyl group. Okay, if it's there's a, if there's a if there's an OH group. Okay, that's the that'll be replaced, right? This will these hydroxyl groups will become a phosphate groups, and I'll kind of draw that and show you how that's represented. But uh, hydroxyl groups. So uh, same thing here, hydroxyl groups. And now here. Um, uh, when we're adding a phosphate group to an alcohol, target alcohol, specifically, I want to keep you, have you keep in mind um, the idea that um, which which amino acid residues have uh, hydroxyl groups, right? Like uh, like tyrosine, serine, and threonine, right? They all have OH groups on their side chains. Those side chains can be phosphorylated. That's something I want you to keep in mind. Okay, so how would a hydroxyl group become um, a phosphate group? The way it would could be drawn to be represented it would look something like this. So instead of an ROH, it would look like this. You have an R O P O three two negative, and that would actually look like this specifically. You have a P and then three more O's. Okay, so these two negatives here. That's how a, a phosphate group would look. And this would have to happen on an OH group, right? Which um, could be on a tyrosine, a serine, or a threonine. Okay, so now with there are two different types of enzymes that can actually do phosphorylation. And there's only one that I'm going to mention that um, does dephosphorylation. So a phosphorylase um, is a type of, uh, of enzyme that will phosphorylate things. It'll add a phosphate group. Now, specifically, um, phosphorylases, what they do is they add, um, they add, the word, it's a matter of where they get their phosphate. They add a phosphate group, um, or excuse me, not, I want to write, they add an inorganic phosphate group, which is just a, a phosphate group from the environment, okay? Um, from the cell kind of just floating around, okay? So, um, whereas the second thing, the second type of, uh, of enzyme that, that uh, actually before I mention the second type, let me give you a quick example. Um, an example of a phosphorylase uh, that we're going to talk about in just a moment is glycogen phosphorylase. We're not going to talk too much about it, um, but I want you to just keep it in mind as an example, glycogen phosphorylase. So the other type of enzyme that you know undergoes phosphorylation that adds a phosphate group is a kinase or a kinase, whatever people call these kinase, what they do is they also add a phosphate group. But what makes them different from a phosphorylase? What they do is they add a phosphate group from ATP or another um, 
or another uh, nucleotide tri nucleoside triphosphate. Okay. Um, okay. Usually it's ATP, though. Generally speaking, that's how how, how I'm going to source it. I'm going to sort of associate the word kinase with adding a phosphate from an ATP, as opposed to just adding an inorganic phosphate. Whereas, um, so an example of a, of a kinase, an example of a kinase is um, hexokinase, which is uh, the first enzyme in glycolysis. And what it does, it's a kinase, and it adds a, uh, a phosphate group to the hexo. Hexo means six. It's actually going um, to add a phosphate from ATP to the sixth carbon. Six carbons OH group. We'll see that later in the video on glycolysis. But that, but the thing is, this name makes sense, right? And um, that's something to bear in mind. Phosphatases, phosphatases are not the exactly reverse of a kinase, but the, what they do is they remove a phosphate uh, via hydrolysis. They remove phosphate groups by adding water. which is hydrolysis. They hydrolyze the bond. So this is how, you know, this covalent modification is reversible, right? We can make the covalent bond to a phosphate group. But we can also remove it by just adding water. So that's the whole idea behind this covalent modification being reversible. Okay. So now I want to mention something. I'm not going to actually write it down. Um, but within kinases, there are particular kinases called like protein kinases. Um, we'll learn about those more when we talk about signal transduction, which I mentioned up here. Um, another thing I want to mention is that this this bond here, right, that we have between this O and this P, is a phosphate ester bond. Notice if this was a carbon here, this would be considered an ester bond, right? But now, um, or an ester linkage, but here because it's a phosphate, it's considered a phosphate ester um, linkage. Okay. Um, and also, there's also protein phosphatases or phosphoprotein phosphatases. Um, not something terribly important just now, but an example of a phosphatase um, is uh, glucose 6 phosphate, phosphatase, which is actually the enzyme that does the reverse step of hexokinase. So hexokinase adds a phosphate uh, from ATP to glucose, right? The sixth carbon um, of glucose. Whereas glucose 6 phosphatase catalyzes the reverse reaction, which removes that phosphate. Um, removes the phosphate off of uh, the sixth um, carbon's OH. Okay. And of course, again, via hydrolysis. Okay. So I hope that makes sense there and how it's reversible. Uh, so let's talk about this quick example of glycogen phosphorylase and how these kinases and phosphatases sort of come into play. So if we think about glycogen phosphorylase, we're gonna like I wrote here, <clears throat> excuse me, more on this later. Um, it, in short, though, it's an enzyme that catalyzes the breakdown of glycogen into glucose. So if we think about uh, glycogen phosphorylase, this is the enzyme. Let's just this is a represent, representation of the enzyme. Um, this you can imagine this enzyme in its um, here, right, and we can, um, and this this will be what we'll call it the the unactive form or the inactive form. Okay, the inactive form specifically is glycogen phosphorylase B, right, inactive or at least in in the least less active. Okay, kind of sort of like in a in a in a T state. So um, so what happens is we can activate it by um, adding these phosphate groups. Okay, so this this glycogen phosphorylase over here is active, or at least more active. So this glycogen phosphorylase is actually glycogen phosphorylase A. So adding these phosphate groups, how did they get there? Well, there was this enzyme phosphorylase kinase. Let's see if this name makes sense. It's a kinase, so it adds phosphate groups. That makes sense. We took this glycogen phosphorylase and we added these phosphate groups. So it makes sense that it's a kinase. And it's a phosphorylase kinase, which means it added the phosphate groups to phosphorylase, which is 
this enzyme. This enzyme is glycogen phosphorylase. So, but where did it get these phosphates from? Specifically, you got them from ATP. So if this is the reaction arrow heading towards this, this glycogen phosphorylase A, then we must have added some ATPs. Specifically, we added two of them, right, because we added two different phosphate groups. So we input two ATPs, and we get out two ADPs, right? Because once we take off a phosphate from the adenosine triphosphate, then they become diphosphates, right? Um, to catalyze the reverse reaction, we have a different enzyme, a phosphatase. So the phosph this is phosphorylase phosphatase. So it's going to be the enzyme that removes phosphates from phosphorylase, from this glycogen phosphorylase, by adding water. So here, we're going to input water, and then off pops those two inorganic phosphates. Oops, that's kind of ugly. Okay two inorganic phosphates. So this reaction up here, we inputted two ATPs to get to attach those two phosphates to make an active form. And then here we added water to um, to hydrolyze those bonds and go back to this inactive form. So depending on whether or not we want to break down glycogen for glucose, we're either going to activate glycogen phosphorylase or deactivate it. So um, in cases where we want to break down glucose, we want this form. So we want this enzyme to be active so that it can activate glycogen phosphorylase. But if we don't want to break down glycogen, if we want to store glucose as glycogen, we want to make sure that the, the, the phosphorylase is inactive. So we would add water um, to, um, to hydrolyze those bonds via this enzyme. We would want this enzyme to be active to make this one inactive. Okay. Uh, one thing I want to note is that it's not always the case that phosphorylation activates uh, a protein. Sometimes adding phosphates can deactivate it. It just depends on the protein. Okay. So that's something I, I'll just note here is that um, note, phosphorylation does not always activate a protein. It can deactivate a protein. Oops. It just depends on the protein. One last thing I wanted to mention. I mentioned that these phosphate groups had to be attached to hydroxyl groups. Okay. Now, in the case of glycogen phosphorylase, these two phosphates were added onto particular OH groups. Those H groups were um, serine residues. Okay. So I want to note that as well. Not that that's terribly important, but it's just something to you know keep in mind. These were both attached, right, to a serine residue, right. Right, because serine has an OH group in its side chain. Okay, so I hope that was helpful, and I'll see you in the next video.